Hello, and welcome to this module on the Oracle Cloud Infrastructure File Storage Service, also sometimes referred to as FSS. After completing this lesson, you should be able to explain File Storage Service and its use cases. You'll be able to create, configure, and mount file storage service volumes, and you'll be able to create snapshots of the file storage volumes that you have. As a quick storage primer, it's important to note that block storage shares raw devices and can be thought of as working with bits and bytes, whereas file storage operates at a higher level and, as the name suggests, works with files and folders. The file storage system, also referred to as NAS or a network attached storage, still has to communicate with the disk drives on its backend via block based protocols. Some simple NAS setups, as outlined below, use the client to mount a file system on the front end. Uh, the NAS appliance. Well, on the back end, the NAS performs the required block level storage input output transactions. Effectively, the NAS device or the NAS appliance hides the block level complexity of the clients. NAS protocols include NFS or network file system, version 3 and version 4, also CIFS, sometimes called SIFS, and SMB, often called Samba. If we take a look at the, the matrix here of different storage options, file service falls somewhere in between lowest latency and highest durability. The file storage service is a durable, scalable, enterprise-grade network file system and is ideal for enterprise applications that need to share files across multiple, multiple compute resources. Keeping in mind that a block volume currently can be attached to one compute resource at a time, but in situations where an application requires shared storage across multiple compute resources, FSS makes an ideal solution. Some of the key benefits of the file storage service include elastic growth. There's no need to provision any capacity. There's no need to pay for a pre-allocated amount of space. We simply provision the file system and begin loading data, and the customer is only ever charged for the amount of capacity that's actually used. This is an enter enterprise grade file system or file storage system by design that makes it dynamic, it's enterprise grade, it's able to scale to meet the needs of the customer storage requirements. The file storage service is also fully managed. So when the customer provisions a file system and a mount target, everything behind the scenes is automatically taken care of by the Oracle Cloud infrastructure team. Anytime there's a need to upgrade software, address failed components, or deal with capacity growth, that's automatically handled behind the scenes, and there's no need for the customer to worry about any of those particular items. It's really easy to deploy. So merely create a file system and a mount target within a couple of clicks, and then the mount target can be accessed by instances within the region, instances in other regions, or potentially even instances in a customer's on-premises location. Access to FSS, uh, is pretty straightforward. We can create the file system via the OCI management console. We can create it using API calls, the OCI command line interface, or even using Terraform to automatically generate both the file system and the mount targets. And from a data protection perspective, this is a highly available, highly durable construct within a single availability domain. So all data that's stored on FSS is automatically replicated across multiple storage devices or storage appliances to ensure that component failures will not affect the customer's data durability. We look at a few key service characteristics here. Uh, FSS utilizes NFS v3. Uh, we use a fully uh, POSIX compliant or fully POSIX compliant semantics. Customers are able to create up to 100 file systems within their OCI region with two mount targets per availability domain. In addition to snapshot capability, all of the data is automatically encrypted at rest and in transit. The cost is very straightforward. There's no hidden charges. Uh, there's no tiered pricing. It's a simply a flat rate of 4.25 cents per gig per month measured hourly based on actual consumption. And the performance is still quite uh, efficient, quite effective. So the underlying disk storage is going to be that non-volatile memory, that NVMe SSD storage. And customers can expect about 150 megabytes per second of throughput per terabyte of data stored on their file system. Keeping in mind that overall throughput is dependent upon the network capacity of the virtual machine connecting to the file system. 
So for very small, uh, you know, VM standard 1.1 or VM standard 1.2 instances that have between 600 and 0.2 gigabits per second of capacity, uh, we may not experience the full throughput capable of the file system. But when provisioning bare metal hosts or some of the larger VM instances, customers can experience closer to the maximum throughput of 150 megabytes per second per terabyte. Some of the common use cases for file storage service uh, include lift and shift applications. Uh, in fact, EBS or the eBusiness Suite is one of the uh, precursors or one of the primary driving factors behind rolling out this particular service. So that shared storage that's required at the application layer can easily be facilitated by FSS. For uh, high performance compute or HPC scale out applications, using a, a high performance, high throughput shared storage such as FSS would facilitate data distribution across all nodes in an HPC cluster. And another very popular use case would be microservices uh, via, via containers. So if you're working with Docker uh, and Kubernetes or other containerized service uh, containerized services, uh, you're able to attach a single file system mount across multiple worker nodes um, in a container cluster and access a single shared set of, of content on all of the containers on all of those hosts that's hosted by that file system. Now, if we look at the file system component specifically, we have the file system itself, which is essentially the data storage. We have the mount target, which is an NFS endpoint that lives in the subnet of our choosing. So it's essentially an IP address. When we create a mount target, we specify a subnet and the FSS system places an IP address in that selected subnet, and then we can use uh, that endpoint to control access to our file system. So it's accessible based on both route rules and configured security list rules that allow us to define which resources and which networks have access to that mount target. In terms of protocol, FSS uses NFS v3, as we talked about, and this is the protocol that allows clients to access the data on the system across a remote network. Again, FSS is an AD specific construct. When we provision a file system, we select the availability domain. When we select the mount, create the mount target, we also select a subnet. And we define through security lists and route tables which resources have access to that mount target. So within an availability domain, it would just simply be a matter of um, allowing access between uh, the subnets. From a remote availability domain within the same region, Again, making sure that we have uh, security lists to allow access from one AD to another, to allow access from the source subnet to the destination subnet where that mount target exists. It's also possible to establish remote connectivity. So if we have remote peering between two different OCI regions, or if the customer has connected their on-premises infrastructure using FastConnect or VPN, it's possible to expose that FSS mount target to that customer's on-premises network. In terms of data protection options, we have the ability to create snapshots uh, that provide a consistent point in time view of the entire file system. They're gonna be copy on write. So when a snapshot is taken, it only captures the deltas of what's changed since the previous snapshot. That makes the use of space very efficient. There's no duplication of content um, unless that content is actually changed and we need to take a snapshot of the new information. In order to protect our file system, we can use a variety of features to initiate that snapshot. Uh, again, the API, the OCI console, the CLI. It's also possible to initiate a snapshot from a host that has that file system mounted. Uh, there's a hidden snapshots directory on the file system, and one simply needs to create a directory or a subdirectory in that hidden snapshot folder to trigger the device, trigger the system to generate a, a new snapshot. If we're looking to create a, a more robust uh, data protection option, it's, uh, it's possible to set up two file systems, one in each uh, unique availability domain, and then use a tool like rsync to replicate data from the source file system, the destination file system. This would ensure copies of our data in two separate availability domains to protect against a very highly unlikely but potential catastrophic failure. It's also possible to do asynchronous replication across region. 
So again, we would establish a second file system in the target region. Uh, we would utilize something like remote peering connection to link the two networks together. And then either, again, initiate an rsync job or do a batch copy where potentially on an hourly basis, we would simply archive all of the contents of the source file system and copy that archive to the destination system. There's also a number of third-party tools available uh, to do file level backups. Uh, those backups could be done off-site, they could be done to object storage. So long as that third-party tool supports NFS v3, uh, it's perfectly capable of interacting with that file system. So to go ahead and create a file system, we would navigate to the file systems console, click create file system, give it a name, choose an availability domain, and then optionally create a mount target. If we already had a mount target created, we can sim simply select the existing mount target. Otherwise, we're going to give the mount target a name, select the virtual cloud network in the subnet where we will place that mount target, and we have the option of specifying an IP address. The IP address has to be within the range available for the subnet selected. If you do not fill in this box, the system will automatically select an IP address from the available range and assign it to that mount target. Finally, we'll specify a path name. So the path name, in conjunction with the IP address of the mount target, is how we access this specific file system. That means that we could have multiple independent file systems on the same uh, IP address, the same mount target, but each file system would utilize a different path name to access the different set of data. When we're ready to mount this file system, uh, we need to make sure that we have the NFS utils installed uh, if we're running Oracle Linux or CentOS. If we're running Ubuntu, we would need to use NFS common as the package that contains the NFS utilities. So once we have that installed, uh, we, would, we would of course install that on the compute resource that's going to be mounting the file system volume. Uh, we would simply then create a directory where we're going to mount a local directory where we plan to mount that file system. And then we would issue the sudo mount command. So as an example here, we would do a sudo mount, the IP address, colon, forward slash, the path name of the file system itself and the mount target. And then we would specify the local directory that we created for use with this file system. Once that command completes successfully, we could navigate to the forward slash MNT, forward slash NFS directory on our files, on our local host, and begin to create, modify, and delete files from that file system. Now, snapshots, they provide a read-only, space-efficient point-in-time backup of our file system. As mentioned earlier, snapshots can be created through the management console or by creating a subdirectory in the hidden snapshots directory on the file system itself, which will automatically initiate the creation of a new snapshot. So the snapshots are accessible both through the management console and through the file system, through the operating system, by viewing the contents of those subdirectories. A single file system can have up to 10,000 snapshots, but keep in mind that since these are going to be differential snapshots, uh, as we, as we, or the faster we change data, the larger those snapshots will be, and the slower we change data, the smaller, the less space will be consumed by those snapshots. As mentioned, pricing for file storage is fairly straightforward and transparent. Uh, it's four and a quarter cents per gig per month, billed on an hourly basis for the amount of space actually consumed on the underlying file system. That means that if the customer were to load one terabyte of data, or a thousand gigabytes, and leave that data on the system for only a couple of hours, that charge would be prorated at four and a quarter cents per gig uh, times 1,000 gigabytes, divided by uh, the number of hours actually consumed. Best of all, there's never any charge for data transfer between availability domains within a region, unlike some of our competitors. So if I have a file system in availability domain one, and I'm accessing that content for my other two availability domains, there's never a cost for that data transfer. So all data transfer within a region is always free. So in summary, we looked at the file system, a file storage service, and the fact that it can provide a fully managed, elastic, durable, distributed enterprise grade file system. It supports NFS v3, 
for attachment to a variety of, of Linux instances. It supports full uh, POSIX or POSIX semantics. And it also includes snapshot functionality and encryption by default. A single file system currently can scale up to eight exabytes in size, but there's never a need to provision any of that space. We simply create a file system and begin to load data. And the file system is also highly performant. We use NVMe SSD storage under the covers and customers can expect about 150 megabytes per second of throughput per terabyte of storage consumed on their file system. 